to do it. Hey, everybody, we're live. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank you so much for joining us here for the second installment of our read along with author Laird Barron and of course the number one uh, horror influencer in your life mother horror thank you so much for putting this together of course <laughs> we've been going we are going through together um, Lord, uh, Laird's uh, crime noir trilogy uh, and we this past segment have gone through the second installment of that series which is Black Mountain. Um, Black Mountain, which um, I was very fortunate enough a few years ago to be at one of Laird's uh, book signings. And so I do have a signed copy for all of the jealous hearts out there. I'm jealous. Sadie is very jealous. <laughs> um, what? I, how I would like to start this time. So number one, thank you all so much for joining us. We're glad that you are here. Uh, we'd like for you to put your questions about the book that you may have either for the book or for Laird in general inside of the YouTube chat. Um, we'll be monitoring those and we'll be getting to those and we'll be very appreciative of your participation. The more you participate, the more fun we have. Um, and then uh, I have a few questions that I uh, have for Laird after having read the book. Um, this is my second pass through the novel. Um, so as I'll be uh, providing those questions to Laird, he'll be answering and then we'll be taking a look at your questions in the chat. So again, thank you for joining us. And I want to go ahead and get started by thanking Laird for being here. Uh, there's a there's a little bit of a windstorm going on in his neck of the woods, so we're glad that he's able to join us. So thank you, Laird. Glad yeah. to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. You're one of our favorites, always and forever. Um, so what I would like to do is, um, for those of you who have read the book, there's a particularly striking opening um, that I want to uh, I want us to sort of relive the trauma of, if I can put it that way. <laughs> Because mm -hmm. uh, I do find it deliciously traumatic. So this is from chapter one of Black Mountain, author obviously Laird Barron. One lonesome winter, many years ago, I went hunting in the mountains with Gene Cavanaugh, a grandmaster hitman emeritus. Sinister constellations blazed above our camp on the edge of a plateau, plateau scaled with ice. The stars are always cold and jagged as smashed glass in the winter in Alaska. The or thin air seared my lungs if I inhaled too deeply. Nearby, a herd of caribou rested under the mist of its collected breath. We weren't there for them. Now, you son of a gun. You started off with this tremendous opening. And one of the, one of the things that is really rem remarkable about your writing there. And I believe we talked about this a little bit, but it is very prevalent here in the first chapter. How do you, I should, I, cause I know I hate to ask this question cause I know, I'm sure you've been asked it so many times, but how does the landscape of Alaska, how does it ring so clear in your mind so that you are able to produce it for the reader so clearly? Uh, a miserable childhood. Mm. I would say That's not, not what you want to hear uh, wasted youth. Those would be the two. I'm dead serious. Mm -hmm. In many ways, it was a horrible childhood I, and would explain a lot about my choice of authors. The fact that I have read so much and, and then directed that into writing almost as a payback in some ways, but reading, reading got me through a lot of it. But you know, a lot of a lot of things that happened to me in my childhood through my into my early twenties before I left Alaska. There are a lot of fun to recollect, much more so than they were to live through. Uh, and there were good times too. But we were on that plateau at one time. I mean, we were hunting caribou. Um, so you know, this is this is obviously just lifted slightly from my from my past. But no, the we had an ice storm here at upstate. Well, Mid Hudson, uh, Catskill region last week, and it's warm now. Uh, it's so if the power does go out, it won't be quite as bad. It's only supposed to get down to like the teens tonight, so it's not going to be too terrible. But it was like fifty something degrees today, and I was thinking last night as I was releasing, we, we've had a little mouse attack in our house. We've been taking capturing mice and taking them outside and re repatriating them to the some other part of the yard, but. Uh, it was like a Chinook going through last night. And I, I think I mentioned Chinook at some point in that story, but basically all that is, is in the winter in Alaska, 
you're used to being 30, 40 below. It's just sub zero all the time. And then you'll get uh, this warm wind will come through and you'll smell like the, the, the trees will be slightly thawed and you'll smell, it smells like spring. And that mm -hmm. takes me back whenever I, so last night I was out walking this little mouse, finding a spot nearby to send him away. And I could smell it with the, with the trees were kind of shaking and I got that, that green whiff of spring, but there's obviously the earth here is uh, far less frozen and it felt like spring, and, but it took me back to being a teenager. It does every single time. It takes me back to my childhood mm -hmm. when we lived in a, sh a leaky, terrible house with people who didn't like each other and um, under really b other bad circumstances. So I'm able to just, <laughs> I go there almost instantly. Right. And it's, it's a persistent, I, I don't want to put too fine of a point on it, but it's a persistent wound throughout. It's a, through a consistency of your work now. And it's, it's interesting to me that our, our first foray into Isaiah Coleridge life, it begins at Alaska. This second book um, also begins with a memory of Alaska. And it, it brought to mind the question, are, are we trying to, is, is Alaska, will it always be sort of this foundational, almost mythical place for you? Yes. And I'm aware that it's specific to me in the sense that, I guess what I'm kind of trying to articulate is that Alaska isn't the only place that has this sort of effect on people. I think if you grow up in the Midwest, you have your stories. Uh, I, I just think that Alaska, you know, it also, and it gets romanticized. I actually don't really think about Alaska in romantic terms, but it, in this, and, and I don't really, actually in some of my short fiction, Alaska doesn't really come off romanticized. It's a lot grittier. The Coleridge, the, the Coleridge stuff, I think to some degree, there's a slight, uh, I kind of erred on the side of romanticizing even its faults because that's the kind of series this is. That's mm -hmm. and I, I, I well, and I like mythological everything about Coleridge, and he's and you know, and you're you're seeing it through his lens. He has a tendency to kind of he's not as frank as I am when he talks about <laughs> stuff. He's like, well, you know, there's a certain amount of bombast to his misery when he was a kid, right? And so. Yeah, he's going to describe things or think about things in these terms. But I do I do think it gets a little darker and grittier as, as it goes. And as you'll see, people will see when they read the book, but also in the third in the third book. But yeah, Alaska is a is always going to be kind of a kind of a wound, as you say. And also there's like a love hate sort of thing about it, because I also owe my upbringing in Alaska quite a bit. Right. You know, I am who I am. And there were many good things that came out of my life. You know, it wasn't all just woe and, you know, gloom and doom. It's just that those are the things, the, the, the hard things are the things that I now uh, hold on to and, and try to, instead of, instead of just being, a, being depressed about them, I try to make other people depressed about them too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I wanted to say really quickly, so I, I did not use the phrase romanticism and specifically don't use it because you have a sort of brutalism, which mm. has in its, in its own capacity, a kind of cold beauty about it. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's inspiring to look at with anything other than awe, right. Or a, a, a tremulousness. Sure. Um, so in talking about specifically black mountain blood, blood standard is in many ways, Isaiah Coleridge coming to an understanding about who he was about, where he comes from. And he is introducing the audience to himself in that capacity. Blood Mountain, or sorry, Black Mountain, it feels like Isaiah trying to understand who do I want to be? He's decided at this point that even though you tried to convince us in the very in the final chapters of Blood Standard that he is not, in fact, a detective, <laughs> we begin Black Mountain under the pretense that I have that if Isaiah is speaking, he says. I am a detective. And so now he's making this statement about who he is and who he wants to be. Can you talk about why that's important for the character to have that conversation with us, the audience in this second book? Right. 
Well, first of all, I kind of I kind of like the idea of contradiction in characters, and it goes first of all, part of it's self serving because it's hard to always be correct in everything that you say, keep everything one hundred percent straight within your own life. One minute you'll say, "Oh yeah, I'm doing great," and then somebody else will ask you, "Like, yeah, maybe not so great." <laughs> Right. I mean, we're, 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 we're right. changeable, you know, but, and so, you know, as Whitman said, I contain, you know, do I contradict myself? You know, I, I contain multitudes. And so I do, to, to some degree, it's, it's characters are going to be because the author is fallible, there's going to be contradiction, but I've decided to make that much. We were talking about last time about re- ramification or ramifying themes like repeating themes or constantly going back to something and hitting it you know uh, um, almost like alliteration you can make that you can it can either be a, a stumbling point it can either be you know you're kind of nodding into your your old man nodding into your cup and you're you're sort of repeating yourself or you can mm-hmm. make it a virtue and, and the virtue is no it is a poetic conceit I'm going to the gray hair, the gray beard, the gray day, the gray land, the gray man, you know, all was gray. And to some, to some degree, it's a way of indemnifying yourself against, um, Mm. uh, not necessarily being an error, but uh, it's, you indemnify yourself against leaks in your, in your narrative or leaks in your portrayals. Right. And which to me is, is really isn't cheating. It's just another tactic of you're aware of your, your weaknesses and you say, all right, I'm not ever going to be able to to, to 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 catch every single thing, and no editor will either. So, how do I turn this into a virtue? And one of those is just to recognize that we do it. This is what we do. We are very changeable, but it's also important that that, that we're sliding into him being, or at least trying to be a detective, because quite a bit of time went by between uh, my writing of Blood Standard, about four years, because it took a mm-hmm. while to sell it. Then it took a long time for it to come out because of various things. It was a, From the time that I wrote it to the time it appeared was four years, roughly four years. So, uh, and from the time it sold to the time it appeared was two, which is really rare. It's usually about a year to, to a year and a half after, but this was like closer to two, two and a half years. And there were various, I mean, <laughs> didn't you know not interesting reasons why right but, the pub- publishing happened to the book you could right, say <laughs> right the glacial nature of publishing was manifest right but um so i i had to really go back and say all right now let's i haven't written coleridge in three years can i just sit back down and write him again and mm-hmm. i did i sat down and he was there but i have changed Therefore, to some degree, Col- and, and, and a couple of years had gone by within the story, Coleridge needs to change somewhat. And so I, I started thinking, OK, if he's going to do this, is he going to be a fixer? Because that was kind of what I was leaning to. Like, maybe he's going to be like mm. this kind of creepy fixer guy. I went, no, he's actually going. Th- that may be part of it. But why It's the limiting of scope? Why not let that be just a solution to some of his problems? Well, if I can't do it legitimately, I'll break somebody's face or I'll plant <laughs> a body or I'll do whatever. But let yeah. me try to do it. It's it's kind of within his the end of the book as he's trying to do things, right? By not by the book, but at least on the up and up. Right. So, I, and I also for the fans' sake, I was like, all right, what's it look like if this brute, who's a pretty smart guy, what's it look like if he actually does try to solve a case or he's trying to solve cases in this case, uh, right. Legitimately, and so that's that's what went on uh, that he he does finagle his license. There's probably a way in real life he'd ever get one, but it doesn't matter. He you know, he pulls strings. So he, he, he illegitimately pulls strings to try to do this legit job. Like if I could just do one more con, then I can, then I can, <laughs> then I can get out of yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it, it, as it develops though, for me, the le- it wasn't really as interesting what his thoughts were on it. It was more interesting watching him, watching mm. him go through the, you know, basically the struggles of, okay, I'm on the phone <laughs> trying to deal with this stuff. And also it allowed me to introduce a larger cast because right. I do a lot of research about modern um, detecting mm-hmm. the quotidian, the prosaic reality of it. And it was really cool. And the first thing I figured out is even a tiny little organization, you're going to require multiple people to support you if you're going to do anything. 
Right. And so that, that allowed me to bring in, that allows me, and the third one does, there's even more, but it allows me to bring in more people. He can't do it all. He needs to call people. He needs to, he needs to bring in Bellow, you know, his expertise, et cetera, and so forth. There's, you know, it allows me, to, it, it allows me to create a larger glimpse. Like you get a glimpse of a larger world that there's, there's always stuff going on in his background that we never hear about. Right. And I think it's interesting to me as I'm reading the book and I've, when I was reading it through the second time, I wanted to ask you this. Isaiah continuously tells us, this is who I am. This is who I am. I am like Hercules. I am like, you know, a, a myriad of things that he keeps saying, I am. He makes these I am statements. Who is Isaiah trying to convince? And are you the author at that point having a conversation with the character where the character is starting to define themselves to you in this second we are out of our larval stage. We are in the pupil stage here. And so is Isaiah trying to convince, you know, what is that conversation like between writer and character at that point? Right. And that's not something that I was really conscious of while I was writing it. But in the editing process, it became more apparent to me. And it's something that I've had in the past. I've said this on many, many occasions that a lot of my writing the more visceral writing derives from nightmares. I, I'm not a lucid dreamer, but I very close and I'm very participatory in many of my dreams, or at least I'm, at least I'm like a over the shoulder camera and there's a lot of hands-on stuff that happens in the dreams. And it's sometimes very, very frightening. And, but one time many years ago, when I first tried writing uh, as an adult, tried writing a novel, I was about three quarters of the way through this novel. And it, was a, it was a dark fantasy science fiction novel. And there were way too many characters. There were probably a hundred <laughs> characters. And it was just, and it was about 300,000 words long, handwritten. And I'm just writing and nothing is coming together. And I'm kind of just learning how to write a novel. Really, I wasn't, it, it, it's, it's in a trunk somewhere that I don't, I'll never be able to look at it again. But I had a nightmare. And in the nightmare, all the characters, or, or I should say all the core characters, we're in this throne room, like this medieval throne room. The lights were out. I've been summoned. I'm standing on the kind of in front of where the, the empty throne. And all of a sudden they started talking to me from the balconies. They step in going, why did you make that decision? I would never say this. Oh. You know, hmm. there were, it, was, it was like something out of a TV show. It was that vivid. Hmm. And it was that twee and on the nose. You know, this is like something that somebody would write a story like, my characters were all talking. <laughs> yeah. this, this did happen to me. You know, this is a dream I had. And it was, I've had one since. And I had one about the Coleridge cast. That one was really hostile. The first one was very hostile. Everybody was pissed at me. And it was, you know, it's my subconscious just, you know, railing at me for not getting it right. I imagine, it, you know, you, as a writer, you imagine it perfectly and then, it comes out as it, wherever the hell it comes out. You're like, damn it. Right. No matter how good it is, it's never what, what you quite what you imagine. And so the, the characters let me know. Uh, and it was, it was a fascinating dream in retrospect, but I had a Coleridge dream here. And it was after it was sometime when I was writing the third one and it was slightly more benevolent. It was more encouraging. It was more like, it's okay. Cause I was really upset about not getting something like not being able to get my, hands on what I really wanted to say about something. And I remember Coleridge and Robard and was it, I think it might've even been the mafia guy, Curtis, who just, they were all just like, and once again, they were all in shadow. I could barely, but they were just like, we'd reach out and just go, it's okay. You know, don't essentially to, to paraphrase smarter minds, don't let perfect, you know, don't let perfection be the enemy of, of the good. Right. And so, you, you, you know, it wasn't so much like it's, you know, this hot mess is good enough. It was more just like, you're, you're, you're going to give yourself a heart attack. We don't, you know, then what happens to us is finish the story. It'll be okay. Don't, right. you know, don't despair. Uh, and so whatever is going on with Coleridge and that, that's less me. You know, this funny thing is it is me, obviously, but it's some deep reset, you know, recessed part of me, the creative part of me that is talking to my conscious self. Yeah. That mm -hmm. stuff is unconscious. Right. Yeah. It's not, I mean, it's not unconscious writing, but it's literally, I'm not, I'm not processing it the way that like we're all processing it in retrospect. When I wrote it, I didn't realize how much it was really my subconscious, that character saying, no, 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 this is who I am. Stop right. trying to make me, you know, and I've described this. I think other writers have too. I've, I've often described it in, in skinning terms. You, know, you can describe writing as carving, whatever, but 
when, when you're cutting, you have to be careful. If you're if you're skinning something out, you get blood on your hand. The knife will twist in your hand. Right. It's constantly if your your hand get your arm gets tired, it's exhausting. And writing for me it, mentally, that's one of the aspects of it. It's either combative, like I'm I'm in combat with it, or I'm trying to to skin or chisel, and I've got to be very. I have to remind myself that I do have final say on this. <laughs> but it constantly Coleridge was is still constantly right. like, trying to redefine himself uh, and, and guide me in another direction. Like it's not so much that we're at odds. It's just that it's, you know, you've got that part wrong, uh, mm. but, but I don't, I don't really think about it in the moment. It's more something that right. comes up at times like this. Like, well, it's oh, I did that. Your brain is like waiting for you to fall asleep so you can't get in the way so that they can talk yes. to you while and, and process through that when you're not, you know, fighting it. I think which, right, right. Absolutely. Which is which is really interesting because Isaiah has the exact same problem. You say, or Isaiah tells us, he's like, My mind is more like a thresher. It needs things to chew on. Mm -hmm. You know, and and one of the things I, I mentioned to Sadie throughout throughout the week is as we were reading is like that notion of the hind brain doing the hard work so that everything can come roiling up into the frontal lobe and we can make a decision. Right. Right. And so that is such a it's very interesting that the process of the writer while they are writing the book is very much the process of the character as they struggle with the self same issue. Right. And, you know, it's really interesting is because not that I write a lot of stories about people that are going through the investigative process so formally. <laughs> right. Like a, I, a lot of my stories, somebody's looking for something, sure, but they're not necessarily following any formal steps. Coleridge, in this case, does. He follows, it may be brutish, but they're, you know, he, he does the legwork. Where, and so, yeah, there's this, this idea that he, that he needs now to, to, he has all the pieces, just let them percolate in his mind like a writer does. But when I'm writing Jessica Mace, she does a similar a, a, a similar method, but it's but it's also different. She doesn't talk about it that way. So um, yeah, I they're my two main investigators, and she's much more blundering and bull in a china closet than, right. than he is. Right, she is. And I was actually actually what what I need to do is I need to be fair to our listeners <laughs> because I'm taking up all of the time for Laird myself because I'm a selfish jerk. Uh, Sadie, do we have any questions from the chat that? folks might have asked yeah i thought this first one was interesting because we were talking in the green room before we went live about this question um so question laird you mentioned whiskey a lot in stories and as someone who loves whiskey myself what is your go-to brand <laughs> and as i was saying in the green room i haven't been drinking much i never drank to excess but i enjoy my scotch uh frequently and for the last year or so i've been developing sort of like i don't know late life asthma there's i thought it was just allergies but now i'm getting more acute effects shortness of breath that kind of thing and whenever i drink alcohol now i can only take a few sips it i literally start coughing and cannot cannot function it's like i have almost like an allergic reaction hmm. but traditionally john and i have tipped many a bottle and like the Glenlivet is my favorite. Mm. I like Akintosh and I like uh, Bunahaven, but the Glen Glenlivet is is my favorite. The, and nothing very the Glenlivet. Glenlivet. Mm -hmm. And I'm not such a sophisticated drinker that I'm like, oh, it's gotta be this year or that. But generally speaking, I like twelve, you know, kind of like it's aged, but not not heavily aged. I, and I I'm I'm very much not a PD. I don't like really PD stuff. So like I, I enjoy um, Laphroaig to some degree, but that stuff is a little smokier and, and thicker than I like. Mm. I like, I love Akintoshin, which is almost like a really mild, I don't know if you've ever had it, but it almost strikes me like Everclear in the sense that it's not as potent. It has more flavor, but it, it doesn't hit you. It, it's almost invisible when you first taste it. Then you start tasting it. <laughs> like it has different, different part of your tongue. It'll take, it'll taste mm. different, but. So those are my. I'm, I'm getting thirstier <laughs> and thirstier. Glen Morangi, Glen Morangi is another one I love. It's Sorry, it's like a riderly drink. Like I see people on Twitter swapping notes about their favorite whiskey brands, and it's just so riderly. I always picture you guys writing your novels and drinking your whiskey. Sw right, swirling glasses <laughs> of 
uh, uh, honey honey colored liquid into crystal uh, cut glasses. Well, up until the last year and a half, I almost always had. It doesn't matter what time of because I don't keep regular hours, so it could be nine in the morning, six in the morning, or it could be five in the evening. I, I would normally have, and I have a whole pantry full of, must have 15 or 16 different types of scotch in there. And I would just, I would have my, my drink by me, but just the last, the last few months has just been impossible. So I, hmm. that's something I, that's something I'm kind of sad about. I might have to look into that deep, more deeply. Yeah. Hmm. Our, our bodies are good indicators of something. I'm, I'm hmm. sure they're telling us something. <laughs> Um, so Austin Shirley, or wait, I'm saying that wrong. <coughs> Austin Shirley. Question, Laird, you've mentioned being a fan of Peter Straub, mm. especially his novel Coco, which mm. we were just talking about the other day, Seth. Was Coco an inspiration in any way on Black Mountain, specifically in the creation of the Croatoan? The Croatoan. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. However, as with all any of my influences, unless I'm doing something that's a send up or, an, or a direct homage to something, it was I tried to make it an influence, not a, a direct, you know, a crutch to lean on. But absolutely. Uh, but I would have to say that about almost everything I've ever written. It's just that it's more overt in, in this one. I had I had different design goals for this novel than I did the first one. This one was leans more into horror and. So there's a little there's a little bit of the silence of the lambs kind of ambiance in there, mm -hmm. um, a little more of a thriller. Like the first one, I mean, there's thriller aspects, but it's still pretty much a hard boiled adventure. This one is more mysterious, more, and there's a creeping. I tried to engender it with a creeping dread, and and nobody does it better than uh, Peter Straub. And and so I would have to say it's not even so much that Coco was the influence or or the villain in Coco, but there that definitely played into some of the uh, the plotting for, I don't, I don't want to say too much for people who haven't read it, but basically identity, the right. identities of the villain, you know, the, the identity of the villain and other people and, and how that worked. Absolutely, I took inspiration. That's like the most direct inspiration. But in general, I would say that it's it's more this intangible element that that I kind of glean from Straub. And I, but it's, I think of him on almost every story that I write Maybe these fantasy stories that I've been working on, these sci-fi fantasy, dark fantasy stories, less so. Those seem to be different. Those seem to be drawing on my childhood, you know, with with uh, Robert E. Howard and and later mm. on with, with Louis L'Amour and and then even a little bit later Jack Vance and and Carl Carl, Carl Edward Wagner and people like that. But mm. a lot of my currently published fiction and especially this novel, I would I would definitely have to say yeah Straub is very keenly present right it's difficult to it's difficult to if we're talking about agents of war who then be, who then sort of manifest into something else entirely that is that drifts into the realm of of killer for the sake of killing it's difficult not to talk about Straub and the Im enormous effect he had on that aspect of storytelling Right. Absolutely. And I've written about Coco and about his about its effect on the modern um, or I should actually, I guess, contemporary, even it might go back that far. But basically right. the modern serial killer narrative, he has to be one of the important literary figures in that because he I, I almost think it's seminal. Uh, Coco is seminal in some ways. And if you look at Straub, and this is why I'm not afraid to constantly revisit themes and even tell uh, the same story from a different angle with different characters is because Straub has repeatedly gone back to a group of men. Sometimes, sometimes they're women, but a group of people who are now paying for the sins of some transgression or something they witnessed in their youth. And it's come back to bite them in the collective ass. And mm. he, he comes at that in so many different stories and books. And so he's given me a lot of courage to go, and Stephen King talks about this. He says, you know, when an artist does, you know, Nick Cave can write about murder all he wants. Like, oh, Nick Cave, but it's now it's like couple murder or it's serial killers or it's whatever. He goes, <laughs> right. but if I do it, I'm just, you know, I'm repeating myself. And so, no, I, I go with Straub on this. I'm like, no, you, you'll never, you will never plumb the depths of any 
even micro genre, you know, within a larger, within a larger genre. So I, I really owe him, I owe everybody that we influences all, yeah. me, but, but I owe him a special debt. He's one of a probably 10 authors, 12 authors whom I feel like I, I wear their influence pretty openly. Right. Sadie, do we have another question? Yeah, I mean, piggybacking off of more Crow Toe and Talk, um, Greg Green has a question. We love Greg. Hi, Greg. Hey, Greg. Is there a relationship between the Crow Toe and Killer of Black Mountain and the Crow Toe and Mystery Witch referenced in the horror tale Old Virginia and the dark fantasy Uncoiling? Mm, some Laird Baird mapping going on here tonight. <laughs> Count on Greg. Mm -hmm. There, I I don't think there's any direct connection between the uh, Croatoan serial killer in the novel and the other stuff. However, there is definitely <laughs> an implied. We'll we'll all discover together how true this is, but. There, I, I definitely intentionally implied a connection between Old Virginia and Uncoiling. So in other words, the, the Roanoke legend itself, the Lost Colony legend and what Old Virginia kind of deals with there as a story is definitely connected to um, Uncoiling. Uh, however, the uh, Croatoan uh, of Black Mountain, he's not directly related to another story of mine, but there's a character in the novel that is definitely pops up in one of my other stories. When we talked about it on other podcasts, I have a story called tiptoe and mm -hmm. so I'm not going to go into too much, but just that there's kind of an important brief. I mean, you can, you can spoil I, all that for no, us. No, no. Want to. No, <laughs> well, this is for you. This won't, if you read, if you've read both now, I won't spoil it, but the photographer in um, tiptoe, Vance, as a child, you know, as a kid, yeah. that is the that's the photographer from Black Mountain. Oh, yeah, I would I don't make those. Well, actually, I read Tiptoe first, so right. yeah, that was him. So basically, that's a prequel to Black Mountain. At least his story is a prequel to his story on in in Black Mountain. So I love a connected universe. And I, tr I I just try to do it in a way that doesn't punish you if you don't. Right. In other words. I don't want it to be sometimes it's unavoidable if you especially like if you're doing a series of stories about a character I, I can't get around that oh if you didn't read some of the other ones you might not get a reference but in general like something like this isn't supposed to stump cause someone to stumble it's only supposed to be if you look back later and go oh wait wait like ellen just the other day went i didn't know that what you weren't supposed to it's fine it doesn't yeah, it do it fun because you're not trying to alienate your audience or no. isolate certain groups but you are just giving a nod to your fans that have been with you from the beginning right. um your little easter eggs that you just hide here and there but like you said it's not meant to be an inside joke between you and your buds and everybody else isn't welcomed it's there well, absolutely right it's extra yeah. it's like an extra and i think of them more as like xenomorph eggs but yeah of course, that's how you think about they pop, it. They pop open, but yeah, right. I love right. it. Right. Um, let's go back because I don't want to skip this one from Josh. They don't miss him. He does want to talk about Aubrey. Um, can you speak more to the role you felt Aubrey's story played in the novel? Hmm, I'm not sure. It's it was a okay. Um, Sausage making speak it. Like I'm talking about how I construct these, and then I, the, the, not the artistic effect, but just all right. I'm gonna the building blocks of building one of these. I right. wanted the novels to each have. The first one's almost like a side. There's all the side quest stuff. It turns out that the main quest is really a side quest. But the I wanted him to the format to be because once again these are these are commercially accessible stories. So I'm I'm trying to have a, a framework that plays fair and is traditional and then go, you know, if I want to like slip some other stuff in, that's, that, that's me, you know, doing my artistic thing. So in practical terms, Aubrey's story is the, you know, one of the sides is one of the side stories or is the major side story. The, the thing that gives you a different um, side of Coleridge, you know, in other words, that we get to see Coleridge in action. Coleridge is like, how would Coleridge go about defending a, you know, a house from a group of people. How would Coleridge go about solving a different kind of, 
and a, and a lower stakes in some ways, uh, maybe not to Aubrey, but a, a lower stakes kind of uh, 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 situation. Now, what I did is something that probably why I'll never have a career as a commercial writer <laughs> is I, something that I like to do in my short fiction is, you know, you're talking about not alien, Mother Horace, whether she's mentioned not alienating the reader. I <laughs> certainly don't want to alienate the reader, but I, I don't always give the reader what they want. Right. I give them I give them what I think they need. And sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong. And sometimes it doesn't matter. They're mad either way. The I like to leave loose threads. And I also like uh, there's a musical term where it's like a downbeat. Like it, it, it ends instead of ends on a it yeah. ends on a put them. Oh. And, I, and, I, and I do that in a lot of my stories. Yeah. I, and I like to. And so I get to tell it, it's an excuse for me to tell another story within a story and then just literally kind of leave it like where I don't want to ruin the novel, but it does get it, the main one of the main characters does allude to that little side quest in a creepy, I thought was in a really creepy way. That was the intention is like, if you think about it, how it is correct that it is very creepy. Go ahead. How did they? And it also answers or it opens up more questions about the nature right. of the, of the villain. Right. And it's really interesting. A lot, like you're saying, a lot of your stories do end on the upbeat where everybody's waiting for the resolution. You end on the discordance mm -hmm. of things. And, but that's one of the, that's one of the things that, you know, that's why a great many of us are here celebrating your work is because of your willingness to say, I know that you want to see the words, the end. And right. I'm not going to give them to you. Um, so anyway, I think. It's a I good think question, that that, though. It is. It's a very good question. Are there any more, Sadie? Yeah. Um, Great. Austin has another question. <coughs> Austin gets a double question. Congratulations, Austin. Blood Standard and Black Mountain touch on a genius loci spirit of the place. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to why? Am I saying that right? I always feel like I'm not. Yes, because no one speaks Latin, so you can say it however you want to. Okay. Is <laughs> important, I'm skipping it anyway. Is important to these novels, and if it plays a big part in your work as a whole? It does. Yes. <laughs> yes. It does. Yes, yeah. It. I felt like it wasn't so manifest in the first novel. But I mean, you guys have read the first, everybody's read the first two, you can see a huge change. I feel like there's a... a a massive change between the novels and yet barely tenuously fingernails holding on to what was in the first one. Right. You know, so it's still, it's still Coleridge. It's still that universe. It's still, it's, I feel like the second one opens it up and we start heading in a different, we head in a different direction as opposed to we've completely changed you know, genres, but definitely black mountain genius loci is a major, like a linchpin. <laughs> we read worse angels. That that's, it's almost like each one sort of ups it in my mind, like, okay, how important it is or how explicit. And part of that is, I, it's in a lot of my writing. I actually have, uh, I've written a couple stories about them now. I'm writing more. I, I had this conceit a long time ago about black hole vampires. Mm. And the idea being that they're mm. like a little, well, you know, years ago, uh, there was the legends about MIT or whatever you know, almost, well, are they going to blow the earth apart because they open, accidentally opened up a little mini pinhole, <laughs> pinprick black hole underneath their university, you know, underneath the um, right. stadium or something. But that, you know, or with a Hadron Collider do something. But, or did it, maybe it has. But no, I love, I love that idea of this thing, whether it's, whether it's the, the sacred and the holy native idea of a spirit, like a guiding spirit in a place, whether it's, you know, uh, from Europe, similar. I mean, there's all over the world. Right. Map these, these ideas of these, the spirit of the place. And it's always been really uh, important to me, but I also associate it with Alaska. Even I'm, I'm talking about not even as a writer, but just as a human being. I, when I think about Alaska, I think about sort of the malevolence that I felt radiating from and, and I, when I say malevolence I don't even mean evil I mean you shouldn't be here you're not yeah. wanted here and right. your body says that to a bacteria yeah. right a virus the body starts mobilizing it's not about 
it's not about good or evil, right or wrong. It's simply you're not where you're wanted and, and there's an allergic reaction. Right. There's some kind of an antibody, you know, kind of reaction. White blood cells come out. And I, I've always felt that about Alaska when I sit quietly enough that I wasn't. And neither were the dogs. We weren't. We just weren't wanted. We're either or they or we're wanted all too much. And I never got the sense that it was in some in some mystical sense that it was sentient or sapient, right. more just any more than your body is, but more just that there is a living organism that is talking to you through the electromagnetic field or whatever pheromones. Uh, it's the wind. Everything is reacting and not necessarily to you personally, but just you could be part of the irritant that is causing right. the, uh, that is causing the wound to, to create pus to expel you as a splinter. And so, yes, as a human being, the idea of genius loci has always been something. And when I say always, at least for 40 years now, since I was a little kid, it has been an idea that I have been obsessed with and have interrogated. And it shows up a lot in my in my writing. It's not necessarily the point of it, but it's certainly everywhere I look, it's there. Right. This is something that I've talked about with Laird before, because I come from West Texas, which is the... Uh, the Chihuahuan desert. And it always feels like the place is telling you, you don't belong here. Go away. Yeah. Right. So yeah, yeah I, I, mean, I totally get that. That's how I feel about the ocean. I love looking at it. I love <laughs> being around it. I love listening to it. I don't belong in there. And it's not, correct. I have a healthy fear of the sea life of sharks and of things that live there. I just don't want to be in the water with anything. Like I, my body physically doesn't belong swimming in there. It doesn't adapt. And so I'm not going to go in there. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm, I'm going with to you. Space. Right. I, I spent a significant amount of time on the, on the sea fro frozen or thawed. And I'll tell you my, one of my first encounters with the idea of cosmic horror, as we've discussed in the past was the, you know, my mom's interpretation of, of, of Old Testament God and how just like you don't need Cthulhu if you have God. I mean, God is <laughs> right. He's every right. He, they like he speaks about himself in the plural sometimes, but I am the beginning. I am the end. But that was probably my first, you know, un incohate for, for, unformed idea of cosmic horror was from my mother scaring me with that kind of stuff. But my first conscious acknowledgement that we're insignificant to, unto not even specks on a, on a carpet uh, was I was watching a show about the Bermuda Triangle when I was 10 or 12 and they were talking about the USS Cyclops and I don't remember what tanker but they were as they're talking the documentary guy is narrating this and you're on the deck of a tanker and it starts pulling back and pulling back and pulling back it takes forever to pull back and this thing is huge it's one of those ones that's like a mile long practically and you, but they just keep pulling back until it's a speck and then it disappears. Oh. And the whole time the narrator is describing how the Cyclops disappeared on a clear day and however many people were on board. And this thing was you know massive, like 300 people, right. Right? right? So that was my, it's kind of just, just to speak to Sadie talking about the water, especially large bodies of water. That was one of my first uh, realizations of just how, minute we are and yeah. and then of course i started putting that together later into words yeah it's like space i mean like even mm. when you're floating on the surface of the ocean like if you're in a boat i kind of have this thought where my mind <coughs> reels i'm like think about the vastness below me and nope. then i need to get the fuck yeah. off like i cannot like i just no. i know no. <laughs> no, i refuse to think about it i refuse to think about it listen to these uh latin uh, people here. <laughs> Mysterium Tremendum? Yeah, what? I mean, what? Come on. Um, how do you keep all of your mythos and characters straight in all of your stories? Do you have your own Mysterium Tremendum? Right, or a or like a collection of all the mysteries that you have created, which is what the Latin means. Yeah, that, it's like great. The, collection, just right? the fear stuff. and trembling. Mm -hmm. right. Um because right, now we're, now I would like to talk about Soren Kierkegaard, everybody, with fear and trembling and everything. But go ahead, Larry. Sorry. Um, no, I don't. I, I love that. 90, 90, and, I, and this has become an intentional 
at first it was just I didn't have that many characters <laughs> and plus lazy. But as time went on, I said, no. I Now I end up spending a lot of time cross-referencing and trying to find things. But I've decided that kind of kind of like the whole idea that we started the show with when I was discussing or we were discussing contradictions, you know, characters thinking something and then they, they and typically in fiction, it would be, I've changed my mind and they beat, they pound the table and tell you they changed their mind. Right. Well, I've decided just to build all that in that contradiction is fine. Mistakes are fine. I mean, you, you don't, you want to minimize them, but that with what I'm trying to accomplish with this huge, I don't know if metaverse, multiverse, but Tapestry. these par these parallel right stories, but also universes is that some uncertainty and some coincidence are also just fine it's okay that actually there might be another character named you know jessica mace there could be or wouldn't be mace but like if i'm telling a story about jessica without a last name because it's because of the formality of literature and how we're taught that nothing can ever be left to chance in literature it always has to be as somerset mom said you know the difference between i think it was him he says the difference between literature at, or fiction in life is that fiction has to make sense. Fiction has to make sense, right. Right, I think I was I him that said that. it. That yeah. is mom, yeah, that is. But that stuck with me. I read that 30 years ago when I was sick and I was reading some of his stuff and squaring the circle or something. And I was just, I came across that and I just went, okay, that's that, that makes sense. It's also why, even though you describe something faithfully, accurately, that doesn't make it good writing. Right. You should be accurate. Yeah. And if somebody challenges you on your accuracy, you have every right as a writer to say, no, no, you know, you can challenge how I wrote it, but, you know, this is true. That's like one of the only things I ever would argue about with a review is just if someone said, no, that didn't happen in 1890, it happened in 1888, you're wrong. And if I'm right, I'm going to tell you I'm right. I'm going to say, well, here's the source. But everything else is is subjective. And yeah. so this right. is right. So this is why. And I I was criticized. I actually wasn't personally criticized, but I saw this criticism. Years ago, one writer was talking to another one, and the, and the younger or newer writer was just saying, yeah, but this happened to me. This is exactly how it happened. They said, so what? You're not writing a traffic report. It doesn't matter if it's true. Your job as a writer, if you're writing fiction, isn't to deliver the truth blow for blow. It's to maybe tell, tell some kind of a truth or reveal something. But you're not. it's not mere reportage. You're not reporting an event. Because yes, if you're a military person or you're a police officer, uh, a stenographer, you report things as they happen without as close to the bone as you can. If you're me, you need to add some, th there needs to be, th this needs to be reworded, massaged and turned into something that is going to enlighten you. I'm not, I'm not giving you a historical account. I'm writing a, I'm writing a, a fictional story about a hitman that turned to a detective and is hunting a serial killer. So while there has to be linchpins of reality, like gravity works and all that, um, it doesn't matter if, if I have these, these anecdotes, like, I, like about the caribou, if I were to report exactly how it happened, it would be boring. So I didn't yeah. report it how it happened. I reported it in romantic, more right. or brutalistic terms. So, yeah. yeah. To be fair, a clear, a clear canon of events flies in the face of true cosmic horror because cosmic horror relies upon the experience of the character, which cannot be relied upon. Right. And, and also it just goes against what I'm trying to do with kind of fucking with everybody's minds and my, my own included. <laughs> well, but and, like reviewers and readers too. I mean, I just hate that criticism about all this accuracy right. and stuff because it seems like there's no bigger haters on fiction than the readers of fiction. It's like, do you know what reading fiction actually is? It's a fake fucking story. Like, why uh -huh. are you trying to get accuracy out of something that's not real? Like, go read, you know, true crime or something or nonfiction books and go shit on them if you're looking for facts. Like, no. we, we are being made <laughs> well, no, we, we love to hate what we love. We, we enjoy right. that experience. Go ahead, Laird. Sorry. Well, I, I, know. I, I agree with you guys. I, the only my especially writing the kind of stuff i do accuracy is important to me in so much as it lulls you into believing the absolute bullshit i'm going to spring upon you 
So he starts. I, right. Yeah. You have to believe the world you're in. But yeah. once again, it's like telling a joke. One person can tell a dirty joke and the other person and everybody laughs. Somebody else tells it and everybody gets up and leaves the room <laughs> or slaps them or something. But one last thing to answer more that question more fully. However, in the fantasy setting I'm writing, I have created a document that well actually i've done i've done one for my coleridge stuff too because the the publisher was very interested in having like you, you mentioned this character in book two you know don't don't mess that up but i have started keeping a, a pretty large living document of the fantasy setting uh just so that i can remember that i called something uh you know the grimoire of celestial malice in one story and i can i don't have to invent that again i can go right and some names and stuff that I don't use all the time. But um, overall, though, this is a pretty new pro pro oh, um, process. And if I feel like doing it in the future for everything, I will. But right now, there's no, you know, Eve Trevigny and mapping and the and and slow cha uh, slow to chase handle at Reddit are are doing mapping projects of my stuff. And so I actually learn stuff from them all the time. Like what? Really? I said that. What? <laughs> That's what I point, said. Yeah, oh. the, I'm at the point now. I forget a lot of things right. that i wrote i love, I just love that cool actually yeah i love that your whole life is about to end up like uh robert uh what is it robert not robert blake that's from the other story but from the main character in the first account of call of cthulhu where all these things are going to come about because of a uh, compiling of papers of disassociated things and you're just going to pitch into your own cosmic horror reality right or <laughs> someone will i'll probably be gone somebody right will. paul yeah thank you paul you know, they are, it, it is so hard not to be a hypocrite. I, I don't, I think it's impossible. I'm, yeah. I'm coming to the, I'm getting old enough to go, you know, just why would you even say that? Why would you even think that you are? Because I always check, does the dog die before I watch a horror movie or a drama? <laughs> and right. I realized that it's not, so, and you know what? And I love a lot of movies that have animal death in them. It doesn't, I was thinking of that. I didn't even realize at the time it just went right. You know, but I'm a, I'm a different person. I'm not the same person that I was when I was living in Alaska. Right. I, I actually started thawing out. And I, I don't mean that as a joke. I actually as started thawing out emotionally. <laughs> took me about eight to 10 years. I, I left Alaska when I was 24. And it was early 30s before I finally really thawed out enough to really hurt. And I just went. And I changed. I look back, I look back at things that happened to me and, and that didn't seem like a big deal. And, and they probably wouldn't be to somebody else. But they are now. And that includes actually uh, all kinds of political views, um, social views, lo lots of things that I I've been kind of going the direction I've been going for a long, long time. But it's a direction, and I have been tra traveling down a down a path. And when I was younger, um, I was always sensitive about animals, but I didn't get overwrought. I wouldn't have needed. Does the dog die now? I won't even look. Yet I write about animal death all the time. Right. All the time. If I were going to provide trigger warnings, well, that would probably be the very uh, first one that I would, I wear content warnings. That might be the very first one. It's like, hey, if you're, and I identify with this one personally, it wouldn't even just be, oh, you know, some people are worried about this. I should probably say something. No, this would be a person. I share it with you. Um, do animals, what happens to animals and stories. But I realized that for me, there's a huge difference. It's almost like when you're sitting in a car, in a car and somebody else is driving and you're just white knuckling. They're not doing, they're not even just like doing anything wrong, but they're driving and you're not. You're just like, oh. that's, I realize that's good for good or ill. That's sort of how I feel about animal, what happens to animals and stories, especially film. Right. That I'm not in control of it. It's not so much what happens to them. It's that I don't know. I, I don't, I can't make the landing soft or meaningful. And so, it, I realized that it's not so much that I have a problem with, especially in horror, animals being killed. Sometimes it makes 100% sense. And other times it uh, also is poignant and it actually has legitimate emotional currency. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times it does not. Right. A lot of the times it does not. Right. And so I actually don't get, Jessica Am gets more horrified than I do. Uh, I mostly just get annoyed. Like, I'm not going to reward you. Oh, okay, so you show us a dog in Act 1, and I know you're going to. It's not going to, that dog's not going to have a heroic death or a meaningful end. You're going to have the serial killer kill the dog, so we know just how mean the right. serial killer is. I'm like, I don't even get upset about that. I'm more just like, I, I'm actually Try offended. harder. Right. 
and, yeah. and so harder. it's it's it's, it's so I'm right. Yeah. But I have to say this is where the hypocrisy comes in. I know for a fact that if you were to go through and read a lot of my stuff consecutively, as opposed to right. and I don't I actually don't recommend that. The I think the Coleridge novels you could you can you can burn through them, no problem. But I actually don't think I write the kind of stuff that I would want to inflict on anyone. No. Story after not. story. Like I, I, I don't read some of my favorite authors that are like write heavy stuff. I read piece pieces of them. Like Peter Straub, uh, a few stories, and then I take a break. One of his books, then I, a novel, I take a break. Not because he's on board with them, but because that's all I can, that's all I need uh, from him right now. I need to right. process that. And so, um, so I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't inflict that on people, but I just think it'd be kind of a harsh experience for somebody right. that isn't, there's some people don't care, but I think anybody has any sensitivity about, about animals, about probably about people. Uh, I'm not somebody that you want to just jump into and, and read lately. It's, you know, and I, I kind of feel bad about that, but I also feel that I don't use animals the way that a lot of horror writers use them. Right. It's never glorified and it's never lovingly depicted. It's just sometimes a bad thing happens. And yeah, right. I feel like I, somebody asked me what, when we were here last time, they said, why did you keep the racism in? You know, because that could have been easy just to have gotten rid of that. And I just, remember I said at the time, I said, I felt like I felt like I had to. I felt like it once I was confronted with it, I'm like, no, you you can't just turn. You can't turn away from it. You have to. You have to tackle this. And I feel like the the. Um, the animal issue is, you know, another one of those things where I just, and of course I have a personal lifelong uh, good and, and, and bad kind of relationship to that whole agrarian lifestyle. And so I don't think I'll ever be able to not include it in, in not necessarily in every story, but it's always there. It always seems like it's important for me to talk about. Right. And that's what I would say, you know, being someone like the people who are in our chat right now who followed your career, animal cruelty exists because the world is brutal and you never use it for needless measures. It is always serving a purpose of at least informing the reader or informing a character of the landscape of the world that they are living in. Right. And all I can say is I'm, I try, but I am cognizant of the, the fact that I don't, like to read that kind of stuff and yet here i am it's it's there's hunting and there's and there's uh war like in my fantasy setting there are war dogs and bad things happen they do bad things um yeah it's yeah. a it's something i actually wrestle with quite a bit and i haven't i just do the best i can with it but i i, I do i'm glad i have a chance to talk about this i haven't really talked about this before because i do appreciate the credit i get for obviously how i the positive feelings I have about animals and my depictions, but I also think it's fair to say, Hey, this guy kills animals in his stories. And that might be something you might, you don't, that doesn't square with you. Right. Great. Well, Sadie, did we have any other questions or comments from our glorious chat mates? No, but the chat was really um, moving <coughs> along with the conversation and everyone was really um, having a good time over there. So yeah, great. Good. Right. I think it's wonderful, Laird. Um, I know that you have uh, worked a great deal to try and... Um, what is the right way to put this? Well, I should just say, you're doing a tremendous job of putting together a long and triumphant career. Uh, we're very grateful that you've been able to be with us tonight. We're very grateful that you are in the world while we are in it. It's especially a pleasure to be able to talk with you about uh, this wonderful trilogy of books. We'll be getting together soon to do the third book in the trilogy, Worse Angels, um, which we're very excited about. Uh, Laird, is there anything that you have uh, coming out soon that you'd like for everyone uh, to know about? Any updates that you could provide your ravenously uh, excited uh, fans here tonight? I don't have any like a major book or anything coming out, but I'm get, getting ready to hand uh, a contemporary horror collection into my agent. And so there'll be the process of her finding a home for that. Yay. And I'll, so that's in the works. I'm, a, I'm well along on my fantasy. I've actually gotten a lot more completed on my fantasy collection this last year than I thought I was going to. 
And so, so that's something that's down the road, but I know that my, <laughs> Balance you know, I keep, to, I do like to talk about it because it's really starting to consume my everything. You know, I'm writing a novel in that setting and I'm writing a bunch of stories and I'm uh, really excited about it because I feel like it's, I don't know if I'm quite old enough to have an opus, but I'm like, I'm working on, I feel like maybe that everything I've done is sort of, I've come full circle. I used to write fantasy when I was a kid. That's what I wrote. And I've never really published much of it except for just a handful of stories the last few years. And I feel like maybe everything I've done since is now I'm smashing it into this because it's not typical. It's, it's definitely fantasy that could also be part of this book, this uh, mystery uh, trilogy. But uh, I do have store, uh, several stories coming out. One of them will be in Ellen Datlow's Screams from the Dark. Yeah. Which is coming out in June. And I'm really excited. There's 29 authors. I just authors. on my Kindle, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have? Right. Mm -hmm. I haven't even, I haven't even seen, well, maybe I, I'm trying to think if I have a PDF of, sometimes I get to see the other stories, but it's just a who's who and it's full of monster stories. So, and my story is um, set in antiquity. It's, it's set in that fantasy realm. So, yeah, that's the that's probably the in the near future the big one coming up. And I have hey. a, I do have I'll be on uh, Mike Davis's podcast, Easing Lovecraft Easing, talking with uh, Sean Hazlitt about his anthology, the World Weird World War Four anthology. Mm. I have a Rex story, a future Rex the War Dog. Yeah, it's uh what the Adventures of Rex, the Further Adventures of Rex, uh, two million eight or CE. So there's a short story about him in there. So I'm hard yeah. at work. Yeah, like I of said, course you are. Collections on the way. Just well, we appreciate after. that you took time out of your schedule to hang out with us. It was really cool. Happy to, yeah, happy to talk so to much. everybody. I appreciate everybody showing up and asking questions. Real nice. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, again, we are very happy that you are in the world while we are in it with you, Laird. And we appreciate your time. Make sure to check out uh, Sadie and Laird's and mine. Twitter and feeds and mine. See it at CS Humble <coughs> for those of you who don't know. Uh, check out our Twitter feeds. We will be able to let you know when our next and final read along is going to be. We will try not to weep too greatly at the end of this wonderful little trip. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. And we are going to see you next time. Same layered time, same layered <laughs> channel. All layered, all the time. All layered, all the time. Okay, thanks, you guys. Thanks for coming thank out. Thank y'all. Good night, everybody.